So in reference to the third question, um, I think the more important or at least the more relevant question to society is uh, how quickly can we respond to a virus that outbreaks yeah. and how quickly we can yeah. kind of sort of tackle yeah. it. Um, so I guess my question is, well, what is, what is the answer to that? And like, at, specifically with like vaccinations, I, I always wondered yeah. why certain viruses we can sort of vaccinate, create vaccines yeah. really easily and others we can't. There are two questions in there, They're both very good questions. The first one is, is global is global politics okay? And I'm not an expert in global politics. So, the, but the world needs needs to pull together. So, if it emerges in Southeast Asia, or even say in the U.S. In, on on day one, the world has to completely be linked up, and global health authorities need to act concerted manner to stop this thing spreading. So that's that's geopolitics. That's what it needs. That's 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 not for scientists to really. That's what politicians work out. But it, SARS, it worked pretty well, okay. And H5N1 was doing okay, so that's, that's a different thing, I agree. Vaccination is a very good question. So um, the, the simple rule is this. If, so when we vaccinate, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, make it a, a, the, we're trying to stimulate the immune system's response to the pathogen, okay? Some pathogens, some viruses are so variable in their kind of coat, their structure, their, their coat protein, that we can't protect ourselves against all the strains that are in the population, okay? So influenza, we have, to, we have to get a new vaccine every two or three years because it's evolved onwards in that time period. HIV is so diverse that many people, including myself, don't really think a vaccine's ever really gonna work, okay? The, the, those viruses that are very, very diverse in their kind of structure are very, very hard to vaccinate against. Hepatitis C, HIV, very, very difficult. The ones that are more conserved, we can, we can do. Good example, rabies virus. Louis Pasteur invented, invented a vaccine to rabies virus in 1888, I think it was, late, late 1880s, and he never, ever saw the virus. He never, ever saw rabies virus. He didn't know what viruses were, but he knew there was something there, and that virus is very, very, very stable, and his vaccine still works today, okay? HIV, there's just no evidence yet, good evidence yet that people really believe that vaccine's really gonna be the answer, so. It's how, how variable they are. If they don't vary that much, we can do it. If they vary a lot, we're in trouble. Well, I have a quick question before we uh, move on. Um, you were mentioning the different viruses that sort of live in different <coughs> organisms. What about what kind of viruses live in us? And is there any chance that those could one day mutate into something that could attack us? Um, so, all I can say with certainty is we carry a lot more viruses than we know about, okay? And most of them don't do anything. Now, you all, you all finished eating, okay? So they've done lots of work now on human fecal material. I hate to, I'm sorry to say this, but they, they sample human fecal material and they find lots and lots of plant viruses. You find tons of plant, because we, they come in, we eat them and we, we just excrete them out. So people are now looking in human teeth, looking in lymph nodes and lungs and brain, looking for lots of viruses. So we carry lots of things. Also, our germline, our, sorry, our, our DNA, our own cells, in our own cells, there are, there are dead viruses. We know this, it's well known, okay? Remember, most of our DNA doesn't encode our own protein. It's kind of parasites or doing other stuff. Some of that parasite is virus. And it's theoretically possible, not really totally proven, but possible that they could be reactivated. So you may have heard there's, there's been some, some suggestions that for, um, for some organ transplants, there's not enough human donors to donate organs, okay? So maybe we should use animals, like pigs, because pigs are kind of similar size. So let's say, for example, we, so we're gonna use pig livers to transplant rather than human livers. One, one worry about that is that human, you may scan for every virus you want to in that pig liver, but in the pig's DNA, there may well be integrated in there a dead virus that could get reactivated. So that, that kind of worries me. So um, I think, People who work on viruses, I think they would, they would, it's a kind of cliche, but we are really are scratching the, the, the surface of what's out there. There's lots, lots more, okay? And in our own bodies, we carry things that are completely benign. So watch this space. So I have a question regarding the prediction of emerging viruses. So it's my understanding that the seasonal flu vaccine is basically based on a prediction mm -hmm. every year. And I think yep. sometimes it's wrong, but yep. what can we take from that prediction technique? Is it a possible to apply that to other emerging viruses? In other words, are there viruses that we know genetically that are like one or two steps yeah. away from 
emerging in humans and if, is it possible to predict in that way? It's a very good question. So on the influenza vaccine, so they, they do, so every year they, they predict what the next vaccine strains, so the, the reason why they do that is, is as follows. The vaccine for influenza, you grow in chicken eggs, okay? You have to grow it up in eggs. And it takes about six months to grow enough vaccine to make it work. So the, H, the H1N1 vaccine, it took a long time to get because they had to grow it in these eggs. Because of that, they predict at least six, maybe more than nine months in advance of the flu season, what the strain will be so they can have time to grow it in the chicken eggs. And they get it wrong about once every three years, okay? And there are kind of two schools of thought on this. One is they do a really good job and they, they, it's, you know, it's, they, it's, it's difficult to do and they, they make a mistake. The other one is they can choose any strain they want. It makes no difference, okay? They, if it's going to work, it's going to work. If it's not going to work, it's not going to work. I kind of sit in the middle of those two, I would say. So um, what you get from that is predictions very, very difficult. So the, the holy grail of influenza research is predicting where the strain's going to go next year so we can make the vaccine more efficiently. No one has been able to do that yet. I try and work on this a bit myself. It's really, really hard to predict. You're trying to predict evolution. And evolution is many things. Predict predictable, it really isn't, okay? So that's a very hard thing to do. A better technique for flu, incidentally, is rather than trying to predict it, to try and make a vaccine that can recognize all the strains out there. That's the other kind of technique. So it's, it's so protective. It doesn't matter if it's evolved a bit, you're still going to get it. Your other question, are there things out there that are only one or two steps away from merging humans? That's a very good question. And I don't think anyone's really thought about it in that sense, okay? Going back to what we said before, I, that there are, we know there are pathogens that circulate in, in, in apes and prim, uh, non-human primates, monkeys and apes, that, that would probably work in human cells. I work on a thing called dengue virus, very common. You've been to, you, may, you may have been to tropical countries that have dengue. Dengue is really another monkey virus, okay? And there are potentially more strains out there of dengue that could get into humans. Now, dengue's jumped four times already from monkeys to humans. Who's to say it wouldn't jump anymore? So that, to me, is a very good one. We need to, because it, it's, got a past, it's got a past record, okay? It's got history. It's got form. So maybe it will do it again. So the ones that have done it once have got a good chance to do it again. But it's a very good question you asked, I would say. I had a question as well. Um, some people have um, actually read this in a science fiction book a couple years ago, and it came back up in real life. Um, a super strain of, say, AIDS yeah. that would kill other strains but not the host. Is that, to a, to a lay person, is that ever a possibility? Not necessarily with AIDS, but with any infectious disease. The benevolent infection. So that's in science fiction book, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's a good reason for that, I would say. So yeah. it's, <laughs> Tell me uh, about it. So can you say that again? So you're saying there's a, there's a strain of virus that would... So there's some... There was recently one fellow who had an AIDS virus. Yeah. Um, I think it was a fellow. And it has not killed him okay. in how many years? Like 20... Yeah, yeah, okay. You've, you've heard about this? Yeah, so... so virus, so okay, yes. Why not give everyone something like that? Oh, and that protects them against every, everyone else? Yeah, okay. So um, you're, you're making a very good point. So we, we know that some viral strains naturally differ in their virulence, okay? So some are, if you're lucky, some things more benign. So there are some people who've had HIV for 25, 30 years who've never got disease. That's a very, very small fraction. They're called long-term non-progressives. Now, they are, they are the source of intense study. Why is it that they can handle the virus for so long. And the answer is, it's more them than the virus. It's more their body happens to have a genetic configuration that allows them to recognize and control that, that, that infection better than this. Actually, your T-cell response is better in those people, it turns out.